Well, good morning. It's good to see you here today, and thank you for your prayers last week. As Dr. Stratton just mentioned, I traveled with the Southern team and had a good time. We're going to go to First uh, Timothy chapter 4 this morning and uh, talk about a subject. Last semester, I mentioned uh, to you publicly, if you had something that you would like me to speak about uh, representing student life, that I would do that. And I had a few suggestions And this morning, I would just like to go through uh, talking about what God, how God views our relationships. And in specific, when we look at this, you might go, oh, automatically, well, he's going to talk about dating relationships. He's going to talk about uh, relationships like that. Well, we are going to talk about that. I'm going to be speaking twice this month, but I don't think the second time I'm going to be speaking about that. And I'll continue it in March. But the reality is this morning what I'd like to do is just talk about relationships as God views them. And we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm excited about the opportunity because, you know, uh, things change over Christmas. And you guys are back again ready to do school. And some of you are overwhelmed right now. We have some new students and things like that. So I'm really excited about the opportunity to speak this morning. I don't know about you, but... um, did any of you make um, New Year's resolutions, per chance? Anybody at all? Some of you. Some of you say, I don't make them anymore, including myself. I don't make them anymore because I, I just don't stick to them. Um, but I, I, I'm in the position where it's time for me uh, to drop some weight. Okay? So I, I've, I've begun to do that. You will see, uh, really, I've only had a little bit of a concerted effort um, uh, at lunchtime, I eat a salad, which really, lettuce for me just tastes more gross every time I bite into it. And, and so I started eating salads and everything like that. And during Christmas, my kids were asking um, for a Wii. And uh, how many of you have a Wii? I just want to know. How many of you, have, you say it's here or there or everywhere? Okay, maybe back home, things like that. We, well, they were asking for a Wii, so, but we didn't plan on getting them a Wii. And it was funny because everybody in my family got uh, my brother got for his family uh, a Wii and stuff like that. So the pressure was on. Well, after Christmas, when I went out to get a Wii, uh, they were all sold out. So I started looking for a Wii on Craigslist, and I finally found one. And I got this Wii, and, man, the way it set up, it was awesome. The kids were loving it. You know, um, I'm trying to figure out the bowling and all that good stuff. And my wife says to me, she says, well, we've got a Wii, but I want a Wii Fit. And if you know what a Wii Fit is, it looks like a scale. And I said, uh, it's a little board, and it communicates with the Wii. And I told her, I said, I'll go get you you a Wii Fit. And and we made this commitment together. And uh, if if you've seen it before, what happens is is when it it introduces itself to you, it's a computer and it's just talking to you, if it's introducing itself to you, it tells you to step off the board and step on the board. And the first thing that it does is, is it um, calculates your body mass index. And you say, well, what is that? That means it's basically telling you the percentage of fat you have on your body, okay? So Christy steps on, and I know, I know many of you have seen Christy. It doesn't matter what you think about her. She's a perfect 10. She's awesome. She gets on there. Everything's fine. It tells her she's a little bit overweight, this and that. And there's this thermometer. So now it's my turn. She steps off. I'm sitting there with my T-shirts and uh, my T-shirt and my shorts, and I said, "Well, I'm, not, not, you know, I'm as as thin as possible." And and the bottom of it says underweight, which I know I'm not that. And then the bit middle of it says fit, and then the the next one says overweight, and then it goes into this realm called obese. All right, so here here I am standing in front of my TV. And this little voice that sounds like it's coming from a movie, it sits there and, and, I, and I, um, it says, okay, step on, okay, step off, okay, step on. And the first time I step on it, I step onto that thing and it goes, ooh. I looked at Christy, I said, let's take it back. No, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> ooh. And I'm sitting there watching this thing, and and I'm like, okay, it can't be that bad. I put in my height, I put in my age and everything like that. And that thing just, you know, your body mass index is supposed to be 22 to 24, and it gets up to 24, and it just keeps scrolling. It keeps going and going and going. And I'm like, man, 
what is going on? So it goes all the way up to the obese. And every day before we traveled for the South, Car- the South Carolina and South team, I was on the Wii at 5.30 in the morning hearing this little thing say to me, ooh. So I'm on a mission. I'm making myself accountable to you because uh, I really don't want to get more heavy. <laughs> and in the Wii's term, obese, Like, I've got to lose some weight. Now, I want you to think about something this morning as we talk about relationships. Think about yourself if you've ever had an instance like that where you stand on something and and right in front of you is God's Word. and, And sometimes God's Word just hits us like a ton of bricks. And when we stand on and we say, okay, God, I'm standing away right now because I'm afraid to be evaluated by you. But right now I'm going to step onto this thing because I need to make sure that my life is in accordance with your word. And, and, and sometimes it's amazing when we look into God's word uh, that all of a sudden in my own life and my personal devotions, um, God says, ooh, ouch. Ryan, you, 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 you've messed up here. And you know what I'm concerned about for you today as I gave that little silly example about stepping onto a scale? You know what I'm concerned about for our young people here? Because you're still considered young. God is concerned in relationships with purity because He is pure. And you know the thing about our God this morning that's lovely? is that maybe you are here this morning, you say, Ryan, uh, Mr. Dupay, you might say this morning, I have messed up in the past. I have done it. We have a God who says, I forgive you. And says, pick up again and start living for me. And as I look at the young people here this morning, and I know that we as administration have prayed for you over Christmas break, I will say this, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know that there's people in here that fell over Christmas break. You say, how do you know that? The percentages are against us. I don't have absolute knowledge of you and your name. But the percentages are against us. And when it comes to relationships, what I'd like to address first this morning is how pure our God wants us to be. You know, he said this in 1 Peter. He said, Be ye holy, for I am... What? Holy. He said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. If you look in Genesis chapter 17, he talked to Abram before it was Abraham. And he said this, before the Word of God was written. He said this to Abraham. He said, I want you to realize that I am your God. And he says, I want you to be upright. And he said, I want you to be perfect. You know, if I know Jesus Christ is my personal Savior today, God has the right to tell me that he wants me to be holy. Holy. Let's talk about society for a second before we look at the passage. Because the passage is familiar, and it's written to a young pastor. So we might automatically say to myself or ourselves this morning, well, this passage isn't written to me. So I can kind of write it off. And that what I don't want us to do is what I don't want us to do this morning is make sure that we write off this passage in our minds because it's written to a pastor. I'd rather uh, get in perspective this morning uh, of what is happening in the world we live in. And by the way, impurity is not just a relationship thing. Impurity is not just something that takes place between a young lady and a young man. It's also something that takes place in your mind and your heart. You don't need a girlfriend to be impure. Isn't that right? Ladies, you don't need a boyfriend or a fiancé to be impure. And so when we look at this from the Scripture, I would like to just uh, give you a few suggestions and hear from you this morning how this affects us. Now, ladies, I'm going to let you answer first this morning. Okay? How does society want men to view women. The society we live in, how do they want men to view women? Ladies, do you have any answers? You got to. I'll wait. I got a lot of time. 
What do you think, ladies? Tell me. What? Okay, on the basis side, a sex symbol. Equal, equal? Okay, that's fine. No, that's easy. That's fine. What else? What else? See, we've got to think about this because when it comes to God's purity, we've got to understand how He matches up in our minds and how the organizational process that God has set up is very important. So since, since we're kind of at an impasse here, maybe a Monday morning uh, speed bump, let me give you perspective from a man. Our society wants us to look at you, ladies, as an object, a possession. In other words, we walk in a society where we're allowed to walk in and we can look at somebody and we say, wow, she looks good to me, therefore I want it and I will do what I need to to get it. It's objective. It's not subjective. There's no relationship in it, folks. Understand this. Because when it comes to purity, even the commercials that were on last night during the Super Bowl, many of them focused on what was mentioned earlier on the perspective that, you, that men like what they see, what they can get their hands on, what they can manipulate in their minds. And we live in a world today that says, I may not know that girl, but I can own her. She's an object to me. You know why we say that? Because we have been, uh, we have been taught that in the society we live in, women were made for us. That's what we come down to. Women were made for us. And so let's go to the guy's side. So guys, you're, you're thinking about this and you're saying, okay, Dupe, um, you're digging your grave here because you're talking about me and that might not be, may be me. I, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about society in general. You look at who, how many commercials have extensive skin exposure and how many times guys are riveted towards that because of the flesh. And it's a natural response, isn't it? It's a natural response because our flesh wants to see it. Now, guys, what about you? What is our society trying to teach us about the role of women? What do you think, men? Wow, listen to that, ladies. We got it. Come on, talk. I know some of you want to say something. You're afraid. Be very afraid. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> say something. What do they try to teach us? If society is trying to teach us that a woman is there for me personally, it's like shopping in a store. And, and in the world we live in, isn't this crazy? Uh, as Christians, sometimes we hear people say, well, the first thing you should be interested in is the heart. Well, that's kind of tough, and I will even admit to you, when it was August or, or April of uh, 1994, when my soon-to-be wife got out of a red Mustang, I didn't say, wow, I need to know what she's like. I said, wow, who is she? You know? Bada-bing, bada-boom. Why? Because my natural tendency is to say... I like her, right? And this is the problem I think that society says today. I think some of our Christian young ladies have fallen into this thing where they say, well, here's a guy that likes me. And he doesn't necessarily like me for who I am. He likes me for what I can give him. And therefore, I'm going to have an emotional attachment to him because I need him. I need the relationship. And what we do is we deceive ourselves into thinking that we have a relationship that's proper before God because we are emotionally attached when the guy just wants a physical attachment. See, relationships get skewed when we don't understand what purity is. And in the world we live in today, what I want to do this morning is just read some things and just help us to understand what God requires of us to be pure. If you look at the passage here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 
Let me give you some of the things that uh, some of the good old-time preachers used to do. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, okay, defines it as the quality or state of being pure, free from dust or dirt, spotless. When it comes to understanding purity, we must understand the importance of what purity means to God before I care about what purity means to me. And so purity this morning, as we look at it, I'd like to read first. Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, it says, um, Refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. So he's saying to this young preacher in the, in, the, in the church of Ephesus, where we already know that there's perverseness all in the city, and he says to him, I want you to exercise yourself unto godliness. And then verse 8 says, For, boldly exercise, uh, for bodily exercise profiteth little. Oh, oh, I can get rid of the we. For bodily exercise profited a little. But he goes on to say this. He says, But godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of life that now is and that which is to come. So I'd submit to you today just three things. If you want to write them down or just think on these things, I'd appreciate it. And I want you to regurgitate them in your mind this morning. Uh, I need to realize this morning that I must be pure because my God is pure. And you might sit there and say, well, Mr. DuPay, I already know that. I already know that. Uh, Well, if you know it, are you doing it? If you really know that God is pure, are you really doing it? In this, as we look at verse 8, the Holy Spirit is speaking through Paul and he's saying to him, look, you need to have godliness over anything in your life is God, the one that we live for, the one that we say has saved us, the one that we say has redeemed us, the one that we sing about and say that He is our Savior, the lover of our souls, is our God, the passion of our heart this morning. Did you wake up this morning and say, well, I have these tests this week? Or did you go to bed last night and say, I've got all this busy schedule and look at your schedule, but go into the Word of God and talk to your God and have fellowship with Him? That is a passion for a God who wants purity in your life. Sometimes we treat God as if He's way far away and we treat Him as if he, He can only come into our lives when the problems occur. But my friend, today, as we look at God's Word, we need to understand God has a passion for godliness in our lives. He wants me to be pure. He wants me to be pure. And folks, He wants you to be pure. He wants us to do that. He wants me to be clean, spotless of heart. Those who seek purity seek the following virtues in their life. And I I would just tell you this morning that I know this is kind of like a shotgun approach to a text here. But can I just give you thoughts in your mind that you can live by? If I'm going to seek purity in my life, I must let godly love be the primary motivation for my life. I'd like to read for you 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. And I'm going to read it from the ESV this morning because I believe it just gives a lot more rich terms and things that we can understand. But for, Because you probably have it memorized in the King James, I'm sure. So let me read the ESV for us this morning so that you would understand what God has for us when it comes to love. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a, or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. And here's where the the, the purity in relationships come in. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy. That's jealousy. Or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable (laughs) or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. 
Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Young people, do you see the idea of purity in God's mind through love is this idea that our relationships must be that which is trustworthy. No jealousy, no envy. The things that are make a relationship good are the things that society say we should always put up antennas about. Well, you shouldn't trust that person. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. Well, I'm not going to let you talk to that girl because uh, I don't want you to talk to her. I, I'm not going to let you talk to him because, uh, you know, you used to date him. And isn't this a, a, an unbelievable thing today? How many relationships have you seen? Because even in the days when I used to date, how many relationships do, have you seen today that end on great terms? I don't see many of them, do you? And in a school of 550 people, uh, you, you avoid each other, and all of a sudden in Cathcart, you're sitting on one end and the other person's over there. And Why is that? Because we truly don't understand. We haven't meshed out and fleshed out in our life what true love is. So yes, the person that I dated in high school is my sister in Christ today. And if things were pure and clean and trustworthy, I still have a relationship. If not, I avoid. I'm angry. I'm embarrassed. And that's what is so important about understanding this passage and, and, and seeing how God works in our lives. But those who seek to let godly love be the primary motivation of their life is somebody that's going to say, I'm going to have relationships that are fully trustworthy, fully upfront, and, and uh, it's not going to have any type of jealousy in it at all. Another thing about purity, they seek to allow the fruit of the Spirit to override the product of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5. Another product of purity, they protect their mind with the thoughts of Christ and His will for each person to be pure. In other words, when I date somebody, it's not about me and what you can give me. It's about me to say, what can I do to let you live for Jesus Christ more? And folks, we're not pointing the finger at anybody this morning. Paul stated it, and Mr. Dupay will state it before you today. I am the chiefest of sinners. God knows that. I am the chiefest. And at 37 years old, that makes me cringe to say that, at 37 years old, I still am commanded to be pure like my God. Still. Things haven't changed, folks. Just because I get married doesn't mean that Satan says, okay, Ryan, I'm letting up on your life for your thoughts. He doesn't, do, he doesn't work that way. It's a lifelong battle for purity. And we need to understand today that God wants us to desire it so much. Not only do I need to be pure in heart because my God is pure, but I must be pure in my body. Verse 12 says this. He says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. I looked at that word. That means moral chastity. Moral cleanliness. Cleanliness. I need to exercise my life in this. May I give us a few examples today and then close? Like I said, I believe this morning that there are some young people that love the Lord, their God, with all their heart, and they've made a mistake in their life. And they're seeking for God and just want to say to God, God, I messed up. I'm here to tell you today your God can hear you. And give you new life. Isn't it amazing that when we go to the throne every day, our God comes before us and says, if, I, if, you, if you pray like I did, I prayed this morning, said, Lord, forgive me of my sin. The ones I know of and the ones I don't know of. Forgive me. And right at that moment, they're gone. God gives us renewed relationships, renewed fellowship with Him. I must be pure with my body. I would think of it this way today. There have been times in my life, and I'm sure parents have been this way, and maybe even with you. Folks, listen to me when I say this. There have been times in my life with my children, 
even right now at 10, 9, and 7. The boys, I hope they make great decisions. And I hope that they ask me in the areas that they need to be asked. But there's one person in my family that will be protected. And that will be my daughter. You say, wow, I'm glad that she's not in college right now. Well, now that's not a problem. You just have to come pruned. But she's going to be protected. You say, what kind of protection do you want to give to her? I go as a father. I did it in Baltimore. And this morning, um, I walked into Gracie's room. And uh, they stayed up a little late for the Super Bowl and had a lot of sugar. And so that just means that they're going to stay, be sleeping a little bit longer today. I knew that was going to happen because it's amazing. My daughter sleeps just like my wife. And so I went to my wife and I said, I love you. I'll see you later. I went into Gracie and gave her a kiss. But you know what? As a dad, I pray for my kids' purity. And you know who else I pray for? The 10-year-old who's out on the playground this morning that's going to marry my daughter. You know why? Because I don't want them to have a conversation seven years into their marriage when they're honest and upfront with each other. And they say, I, I messed up. I know you're my husband, but I messed up. I know you're my wife, but I messed up. And I need to let you know about that because we, we decide to put everything out on the table. And young people, can I just say this to you today? Dating or not, conversation or not, you are not guaranteed that you're going to marry that person that you're taking advantage of physically. You are not guaranteed of it. Some of us have seen marriages stop two days before wedding ceremonies. And sometimes we sit there and say, well, Mr. Duque, you don't understand. We're already committed to each other. We've already got it. I don't care if you've got it all planned out in your mind. That does not give you the right to take somebody and use them the way you think you're allowed to use them. Can I say it this way? Every person that you date in your life, you need to make sure that you understand this. One day they may be somebody else's wife. So the way you treat that person, you're treating somebody else's wife that way. The way you treat that husband, that guy, you're treating somebody else's husband that way. And impurity will cause us to be so self-consumed that it's, it's one of those things where we have to say to ourselves, Lord, I need you in my life because I need your direction. I need you to be the one who is helping me to stay committed. And I would even submit to you today, this is the thing. Isn't it amazing? I just told you I was going to protect my daughter. And, and what am I going to do with that? And I'm going to protect my boys the same way. But I'm going to say to them, okay, if you're going out on a date, where are you going to be? I want to know. Okay, if you're going to go to the mall, what are you going to do? If you're going to go do this, you're going to do I want to know the details. But when they say goodbye to Dad, I want my kids to know that right beside them, in that chair, right beside them when I'm looking at the Internet, right beside them when I'm listening to the music that I have, right beside them is a God who cares more than me. Some of you this morning, your heart is pricked because you have been passionate for something that God does not approve of. And the Lord is quietly coming to you and you haven't realized in your life right now that He is there at all moments, even when you wish He wasn't. He's there. Why is He there? Because He has the right to be there. He's God. Paul said it this way. I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You say, well, what do I need to do? I, I, I would look for a few things, and I... And I and I just have a few minutes here, and I, I just want to read the conclusion to you. And because this is, is a family meeting, I, w I want you to understand, I say this because I love you this morning. I don't say this 
um, to get your mind running anywhere else, but some suggestions uh, for the temptation of being impure. Some suggestions. Please understand this, young people. Sexual impurity is not just from sex. It is not just from sex. Because when I allow my mind to think on the things, and Christ raised the bar, he said, listen, you don't commit adultery when you just lay down in the bed with somebody. You commit adultery when you think about it. See, that's the level Christ takes us to when it comes to purity. It invokes, it it, it includes everything that invokes any type of physical excitement in my life that is to be left for marriage. For marriage. Because God is wonderful. And He says in Hebrews, He says, the, the bed, the marriage bed is undefiled. It's wonderful. Why do we take advantage now of it when we're not supposed to? Sexual impurity can take place in the mind as well as physically. Never ask how far you can go, but rather how pure you can be. Make yourself accountable. Make yourself accountable. I put this down. I don't know when I spoke on this last, but I put this down. Some signs that a person doesn't love you. They just want what you can offer them for, what, for their own good. They just want what you can offer them for their own good. They never want to be with friends. They just want to be alone. And they constantly put pressure on you. That's a sign of somebody that is not looking for purity in their life. And it always starts somewhere. Hard message? Yes. Needed message? I believe so. God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You evaluate me. You press me to purity. You come into my life. Search me, O oh God, and know my, my thoughts. Try me and know my ways and see if there be any wicked way in me. God, I open my life for your operation today. I want to be pure. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day you've given us. Thank you for the attention of your brothers and sisters, Lord, your adopted sons and daughters in Christ. And I pray this morning that you would be with the relationships that we have. Lord, you've laid this message on my heart and in the heart of many people here. We want to talk about relationships because it's important in our lives. But God, as we stand before you, let us let the word of God dwell in our hearts richly so that we will change and do the things we know. For those in here this morning that your word has touched and they need to get up on their feet and say, Lord, I'm going to be pure from this day forward. Help them, God. Help them. Be their comfort and their stay. Be their rock. Help them, Lord, to make the right decisions. I pray that this brings about conversations that are necessary to have a pure relationship with you and with others. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you.